In this video, we're going to study the three-dimensional strain measures. So, what I'm concerned with is I have a reference configuration, and I have the deformed configuration, and I have vectors that change in length, and the angles between them also changes. For example, this red vector becomes this red vector, this green vector becomes this green vector, the black becomes this black, and the angles between them change. And I'm really interested in the strains in the various directions as the object deforms. The first measure of strain is called the small or infinitesimal strain tensor. It is defined as follows. It's equal to the gradient of u plus its transpose divided by 2, which has the following component form. The diagonal components are partial u1 by partial x1, partial u2 by partial x2, partial u3 by partial x3. The off-diagonal components have these forms. In a compact form, epsilon subscript ij is equal to half partial ui by partial capital xj plus partial uj by partial xi. The first function for the small infinitesimal strain tensor is that it can be used for calculating longitudinal strains along general vectors. So if I have this vector capital DX and then it becomes the vector uh, D small x and I want to know what is the strain along this direction, to calculate the strain along this direction basically I want to find the length of DX minus the original length d capital X divided by the original dx, which is basically the engineering strain along the direction dx. I can calculate this using the strain tensor, the small infinitesimal strain tensor, using the calculation dx dot epsilon dx divided by norm dx squared. And we're going to go through examples in class of how to do this calculation. And also given a certain orthonormal basis set, so given uh, some basis vectors E1, E2, and E3, I can use the strain tensor to know the strain along these directions simply by substituting EI in the, uh, so for every I, I could be 1 or 2 or 3, substituting E1 and E2 and E3 in the equation in the previous slide, so the engineering strain along EI is equal to EI, dot epsilon ei divided by norm ei squared and of course norm ei squared is equal to 1 and this calculation will actually give me the following the strain along e1 will be equal to this component epsilon 1 1 which is equal to partial e1 by partial x1 the strain along e2 will be equal to partial u2 by partial x2 which is equal to the component epsilon 2, 2, and so on. E3, the strain along E3 is equal to partial U3 by partial X3, and it's the strain component epsilon 3, 3. The small strain tensor also allows me to calculate the angle change between general vectors. So if I have a vector d capital X and d capital Y with a, an angle capital theta between them before deformation and after deformation becomes d small x d small y with small theta angle between them then half dx dot ty minus d capital X dot d capital Y divided by norm dx norm dy can be calculated using dx dot epsilon dy divided by norm dx norm dy and we're going to go through examples in class to show you how to do this calculation. Now, for small deformations, usually this tensor is used when the deformations are small, all the length almost do not change. So capital DX and small dx have the same length, capital DY and small dy have almost the same length. And so you're only left with cosine of the angles in this equation. And so you end up with this equation that tells me that cosine theta, small theta, minus cosine capital theta divided by 2 is equal to d capital x dot epsilon d capital y divided by norm d capital x norm d capital y. The small strain tensor also gives me the engineering sh shear strain in the planes of the basis vectors. So for example, I have e1 and e2 as the basis vectors 
and then after deformation I get E1 and E2 they change the angle between them there is a shear uh, in that plane the engineering shear strain which is equal to gamma 1 2 it's actually equal to 2 multiplied by the strain component epsilon 1 2 2 epsilon 2 is equal to partial u1 by partial x2 plus partial u2 by partial x1 the engineering strain gamma 1 3 is equal to 2 epsilon 1 3 is equal to partial u1 by partial x3 plus partial u3 by partial x1 and so on and we're going to go through examples in class and don't forget always that the engineering strain that you studied in previous classes is equal to 2 multiplied by the shear strain defined in the small strain tensor. On the uh, course's website, you have a tool that allows you to visualize deformations accompanied by strain. Of the form x1 is equal to a number multiplied by capital X1 minus number multiplied by x2, and small x2 is equal to a number multiplied by capital X1 plus a number multiplied by x2. And so from this, you're able to calculate, or the tool calculates F, the deformation gradient, the gradient of U, the displacement gradient tensor, uh, the, the infinitesimal strain tensor, and the infinitesimal rotation tensor. And it also draws this deformation shape. So if this is the reference configuration, and it's drawn again here in dotted lines, the deformed configuration according to this deformation function will have this shape. The blue line will become this blue line, and the red line will become this red line. The blue line is dx, the red line is dy. These are the components of dx and dy. After deformation, d capital X becomes small dx, d capital Y becomes d small y, and these are the new coordinates. The tool calculates the strain along dx, the strain along dy, and the angle between dx and dy after deformation and also gives you the shear strain gamma 1 2, epsilon 1 1 and epsilon 2 2. So you should try these examples by hand and on the tool just to, to, to make sure that you understand how to do the calculations in this class. By definition the strain tensor is symmetric. One of the fundamental things about symmetric matrices is that there is a coordinate system in which the component form of the tensor is diagonal. And this coordinate system is the one made out of the eigenvectors of that matrix. So, if this is the coordinate system in which I define the strain tensor, it is a symmetric tensor. If I calculate the eigenvectors of that strain tensor, and if there are P, Q, and R, and if then I do uh, a coordinate transformation and then calculate the strain tensor in this new coordinate system it's going to be diagonal with three not necessarily zero diagonal components and zero off diagonal components which means that in this coordinate system i don't have any shear strains all i have is just increase in length of the original of these vectors but there's no change in angles between these vectors so in this new coordinate system I only have stretch and I don't have any shear strain. There is a tool on the website that lets you visualize the calculations. So in a general coordinate system, this is the strain matrix. This is the original shape and this is the deformed shape. And you can see that there is shear strain because the angles between the red and the blue line have changed. But there is another coordinate system which is aligned with the eigenvectors of epsilon. In this corn system, you could see that I only have change in length and I don't have change in angles because the blue and the red and the angles between them do not change. Another use of the small infinitesimal strain tensor is to calculate the volumetric strains at a particular point. The volumetric strains are basically the new volume minus the original volume divided by the original volume. This is almost equal to epsilon 1 1 plus epsilon 2 2 plus epsilon 3 3, which is equal to the trace of the strain matrix. And remember from the invariance of the matrices, this does not really change according to the coordinate system. So it doesn't really matter what coordinate system I use to describe the strain. The volumetric strain is always the same. 
So the small uh, strain tensor is applicable for deformations that are small when the angles between vectors do not change that much and when the change in length is not that high. Once uh, large deformations occur, I cannot really use that strain tensor. So for example, let's consider an object that is rigidly rotating, so a rigid body rotation. So the original, the reference configuration is described here. The deformed configuration is described by a rotation matrix Q. And let's assume that Q is equal to cosine theta sine theta minus sine theta cosine theta. So X, the new position, is equal to Q multiplied by capital X. U, which is the displacement function, is equal to small x minus capital X, which is equal to Q minus I capital X. The gradient of the displacement is given by Q minus I. And the infinitesimal strain matrix is then given by half the gradient of U transpose plus the gradient of U. And if you do the calculation where Q is equal to cosine theta, sine theta, and so on, as, from the, as shown in the previous slide, you get this strain matrix, which is not zero. I expect when I'm doing a rotation that this the strain associated with the rotation is zero. And indeed, when cosine theta, when theta is almost zero, which means the rotation is actually very small, cosine theta is very close to one, so I, don't, I get really small deformation or zero strain. But once theta is large, I get cosine theta minus one, I get non-zero values for these strain uh, components which is really a, a problem with the strain matrix because I'm expecting the strain to be zero when I'm doing a rotation. Another strain measure that overcomes this problem of the small strain uh, tensor is called the green strain tensor. The green strain tensor is defined as follows. It's equal to half F transpose F minus I where F is the deformation gradient. And if we, instead of f, we utilize the gradient of u, which is equal to f minus i, then f on green will be equal to half gradient of u transpose, gradient of u, plus the gradient of u transpose multiplied by the gradient of u. So basically, the green strain tensor is equal to this part, which is already the small strain tensor, plus this small addition or this extra uh, part. And this extra part for small deformations is actually very small. But for larger deformations, it, it has larger values. And as we will see, this addition allows that when larger rotations occur, the prediction of the green strain tensor is still zero. In component form, epsilon ij is equal to half partial uj by partial xi plus partial uy by partial xj, xj plus the sum from k equal one to three partial uk by partial xj partial uk by partial xi. Similar to the small strain matrix, I can calculate the longitudinal green strain along general vectors using the calculations epsilon green along dx is equal to d capital X dot epsilon green dx divided by dx dot dx. Also similar to the small strain matrix, I can calculate the change in the dot product between general vectors. If I have D capital Y and D capital X, and then they deform to become D small Y and D small X, then half the change in the dot product divided by the original dot product is equal to DX dot epsilon green DY divided by DX dot DY. Under rigid body rotation, the green strain tensor predicts zero strain. Epsilon green is equal to half F transpose F minus I. F is equal to Q because here I have dx, d small x is equal to F dx. And so F is equal to Q. So if when I put, instead of F transpose, I put Q transpose Q. Now Q is a rotation matrix. It's an orthogonal matrix. Q transpose Q is equal to I. So the green strain matrix will be I minus I, which is equal to the zero strain. So, so I'm predicting zero strain, or, or this calculation gives me, predicts zero strain when rigid body rotations occur. On your website, you have a tool that calculates both the small strain tensor and the green strain tensor given 
a deformation of the form x1 equal to a value multiplied by capital X1 plus a value multiplied by capital X2 and so on. So play around with this uh, tool and try to do the calculations by hand and compare with what you have in the tool.